In the darkened movie theater, as the national anthem blared through scratchy speakers, a little boy rose to his feet. Ignoring the whispers and giggles of those around him, the boy stood firmly with his eyes fixed steadfastly on the screen. Sit down, little boy, a voice from the theater said. But had he not been warned against behavior that might allow outsiders to question whether Chinese belonged in Seattle? The boy who remained standing was Wing Chong Luke. He quickly learned that the standard preface to films shown in movie houses in the 1930s did not require one to stand when the American flag was displayed on the screen. But the early image of Wing in the movie theater became symbolic of the frequent stands he took as an adult, standing up for the greater good of society, often standing alone. Betty Sing Luke. As the first Asian American elected to office in the Pacific Northwest, Wing Luke was a pioneer in politics throughout his life. He worked to break countless barriers, primarily around racial discrimination and segregated housing. His charisma, liberalism, and commitment to promoting human and civil rights inspired a wave of other Asian American leaders to continue in his footsteps. In 1931, six-year-old Wing Luke immigrated with his parents from China to Seattle, Washington. In school, Luke was the only Asian in his class. The first words I learned, he told the press, were yes, no, and he hit me first. Not being able to speak English, I had lots of misunderstandings and boyhood fights. Tired of being ostracized, Luke drew funny comic strips that charmed his enemies into allies. Thanks to the popularity of Marvel superhero comics at the time, Luke was admired by his classmates. He was later elected class president in high school. After attending a White House conference as a high school senior that addressed the relationship between juvenile delinquents and neglectful parenting, Luke was moved to propose that Seattle's Park and Recreation Department provide after-school programs for students with mothers working to support the war effort during World War II. At 18, Luke served in the U.S. Army. While Luke was away, his family was forced out of their home when the landlady tripled the rent. Imposing her anti-Japanese sentiment on his Chinese family, she said, We're at war with those people. You can't tell them apart. This incident angered but inspired Luke to dedicate his life to social justice. After the war, he earned a political science, public administration, and law degrees, later working as a lawyer in private practice. In 1957, Robert Satyakam and James Young, two Native American men, were arrested for violating state fishing regulations. Luke, Satyakam's attorney, advocated for Native American rights to fish on their land, and was successful. The Washington Supreme Court dismissed the Native Americans' convictions. I was in a grocery store and he came in carrying a uh, newspaper wrap package. I said, what is that? And so he unwrapped it and he said, well, uh, the tribes can't pay us, but they gave me this great salmon. And so he took it next door to our home and, and, and cooked it. Luke continued to represent the marginalized. He was appointed Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Rights Division for Washington State in 1957, where he served for the next five years. From the beginning of his career, Luke faced strong anti-Chinese resentment which had been growing since 1882 when President Chester A. Arthur signed the Chinese Exclusion Act. In February 1886, Knights of Labor Union workers funded ships to remove the Chinese from King and Pierce counties. Riots broke out and deportations and murders during this time created a hostile barrier between Chinese Americans and the white residents of Seattle that lasted for decades. Wayne Luke challenged this barrier in 1962 with his decision to run for Seattle City Council. His friend Ken Pritchard, who later became his campaign manager, recalled, Wing had a sense of American history as the history of many peoples and a strong sense of his own place in that history. Lou confronted the racial barrier when he consulted advisors in the state and in Washington, D.C. They all said, Do not bother to run. Any Chinese does not have a chance. Luke ran anyway, knowing he was more than qualified. He learned not to display his photo in public so they wouldn't know he was Chinese. His opponents began smear campaigns claiming he had communist ties, but Luke worked to gain Seattle's citizen support. A trailblazer in the 60s, Luke talked of women's rights, senior and youth connections, historical preservation, and environmental issues. It was kind of that entrenched old boys club in all the political positions. And so Wing and Ken Pickett brought uh, political techniques that had never been done in Seattle. One thing they did was hold coffee hours. All the other candidates, they couldn't care less than <laughs> meet new people, but Wing would hold coffee hours in people's homes. They would invite, you know, neighbors, relatives, and every time he spoke, he just won the room over. Critics accused Luke of fence-sitting on issues. In reality, he was just extremely open-minded for a man in the 1960s. 
I wish there are more politicians who can emulate what Wing Luke was as a person and as a politician. Okay. Because he's so charming, so tactful. My favorite story, and it really tells uh, what kind of leadership he had. After all the hearing was over, he said these two white men came up to him uh, and said, you know we're against open housing, you know, we know you are for open housing, and we want to thank you for not cutting us off. And I thought, wow, he wins over people even if they don't agree with the positions. On March 13, 1962, Luke was sworn into office, having won with a landslide of 30,000 votes, the biggest gap in that year's election. He made history as the first person of color on Seattle's city council and the first Asian American elected to public office in the Pacific Northwest. During that decade, with the civil rights movement in full swing, Luke's victory, seemingly small yet still significant, brought hope for civil rights activists in the Northwest. The novelty of being oriental does not help. Luke admitted after winning the election. It does single one out, and one therefore has to work harder. And work harder he certainly did. Yet he never compromised his Chinese identity while serving the American people, making peace between what his brother Bob called both worlds. As the first person of Chinese ancestry ever to run for public office in Washington state, I have a great obligation to serve well, said Luke. I accept that challenge of the job in the spirit of my family, of which I am very proud. Luke proved himself capable of the challenge. A reporter called Luke, better informed on more local, national, and international issues than almost anyone I know. In a 1965 Seattle poll, Luke was voted best known and had higher ratings than all other council members. Despite the progressive election of a person of color, Seattle's racist housing barriers remained. Seattle's first city council in 1865 banned Native Americans from living in the city. A century later, most African Americans, Native Americans, and Asian Americans were still locked into tight communities in the Central District in Chinatown. Luke introduced an open housing ordinance, one of the first laws of its kind in America, which would allow people of color to live anywhere they wanted. As he said, The main weakness of the rights movement lay within the decent, right-thinking people who recognize the problems but do nothing about them. As someone directly affected by segregated housing, Luke empathized with minorities struggling to find a home. The rent increases and our income doesn't. It gets very scary. After we moved in, some people in the community came and offered us twice as much money just to get us out. We got eggs thrown at us, firecrackers thrown into the house, and even got a cross burned in our yard. At a conference on housing for minority families, Luke addressed the unreasonable fear people had towards living in a neighborhood with minorities, saying, Minority groups are people like anyone else. Luke confronted the housing barrier directly at its root, racism and xenophobia, and championed human rights. The open housing ordinance passed in 1968. Without unfair discrimination, floods of African Americans and Asian Americans traveled south of Seattle, breaking racial barriers that had confined them for decades. By 1980, Seattle was one of the most racially integrated cities in America. Unfortunately, Luke did not live to see the fruit of his hard work. On a fishing trip in Okanogan County, at age 40, Luke died in a plane crash with two others. Not only did Luke spend his life fighting for civil rights, he advocated urban renewal and historic preservation. He helped save Seattle's Central Waterfront, Pioneer Square, and Pike Place Market. While preserving the past, Luke had trailblazed towards a better future. After his death, friends and family raised enough money for a museum dedicated to Luke. In a letter to Ron Chu, community organizer, Ken Pritchard wrote, Wing realized the central role of museums in the preservation and interpretation of cultures. He dreamed of a museum here dedicated to the memory of the Chinese and other Asians' experience in America. Wing did not live to see it, but here it is. While preserving the past, Luke had trailblazed towards a better future. Four years after Luke's death, Liam Tui became the second Chinese American on Seattle City Council. Ruby Chow was the first Asian American elected to King County's Council and later supported politician Gary Locke, who became America's first Chinese American governor in 1996. Locke names Luke as a source of inspiration in the Seattle Times. I was just in constant awe of him. His intelligence, hard work, and earned respect made it easier for all people of color to follow. Wing Luke had truly broken a racial barrier in politics through which a flow of Asian American leaders could step through.